this is Gistella by Susan Pollock. Time's the problem. Time and arithmetic. You've known from the beginning that the numbers would cause trouble, but you were much younger then. Much, much younger and far less wise. And there's culture shock too. Where you come from, it's okay for women to have wrinkles. Where you come from, youth's not the only commodity. You met Jonathan back home. Called a forest somewhere near an alp. Call it a village on the edge of the woods. Call it old. You weren't old then. You were 14 on two feet, a mere two years old on four, although already fully grown. You're kind of fully grown at two years on four feet and experienced. Oh, yes. You knew how to howl at the moon. You knew what to do when somebody howled back. If your four footed form hadn't been sterile, you'd have had litters, litters by then. But it was, and on two feet be just smart enough or lucky enough to avoid continuing your line. But it wasn't as if you hadn't had plenty of opportunities, enthusiastically taken. Jonathan liked that. A lot. Jonathan was older than you were, 35 then. Jonathan loved fucking a girl who looked 14 and acted older, who acted feral, who was feral for three to five days a month, set it on the full moon. Jonathan didn't mind the mess that went with it, either. All that fur, say, sprouting at one end of the process and shedding on the other, with the aches and pains from various joints pivoting, changing shape, redistributing wealth, weight, or your poor gums bleeding all the time from the monthly growth and recession of your fangs. At least that's the only blood, he told you, sometime during the first year. You remember this very clearly. You, went, you were roughly halfway through the four to two transition. Jonathan was sitting next to you in bed, massaging your sore shoulder blades as you sipped mint tea with hands still nearly as clumsy as paws, hands like mittens. Jonathan had just filled two hot water bottles, one for your aching tailbone and one for your aching knees. Now, you know he wanted to get you in shape for a major sport fuck. He loved sex even more than usual after you just changed back. But at the time, you thought he was a real prince, the kind of prince girls like you weren't supposed to be allowed to get. A stab of pain shot through you at his words. I didn't kill anything, you told him, your lower lip trembling. I didn't even hunt. Gistella, darling, I know. That wasn't what I meant. He stroked your hair. He'd been feeding you raw meat during the forefoot phase, but not anything you'd killed yourself. He taught you to eat little pieces out of his hand, gently without biting him. He taught you to wag your tail. He was teaching you to chase a ball, because that's what good forefoots did, where he came from. I was talking about normal women, you told him the ones who bleed so they can have babies. You shouldn't make fun of them. They're lucky. You like children and puppies. You're good with them, gentle. You know it's unwise for you to have any of your own, but you can't help but watch them wistfully. I don't want kids, he says. I had that operation. I told you. Are you sure it took, you ask? You're still very young. You've never known anyone who's had an operation like that. You're worried about whether Jonathan really understands your condition. Most people don't. Most people think all kinds of crazy things. Your condition isn't communicable, for instance, by biting or any other way. It is hereditary, which is why it's good that you've been so smart and lucky, even if you're just 14. Well, no, not 14 anymore. It's about halfway through Jonathan's year of folklore research. He's already promised not to write you up for any of the journals. He keeps assuring you he won't tell anybody. The later you'll realize that's for his protection, not yours. So that would make you, oh, 17 or 18. Jonathan's still 35. At the end of the year, when he flies you back to the United States with him so the two of you can get married, he'll be 36. He'll be 21 on two feet, three years old on four. Seven to one. That's the ratio. You made sure Jonathan understands this. Oh, sure, he says, just like for dogs. One year is seven human years. Everybody knows that. How can it be a problem, darling, when we love each other so much? And even though you aren't 14 anymore, you're still young enough to believe him. At first, it's fun. The secret's a bond between you, a game. You speak in code. Jonathan splits your name in half, calling you Jesse on four feet and Stella on two. You're Stella to all his friends. Most of them don't even know that he has a dog one week a month. Two of you scrupulously avoid scheduling social commitments for the week of the full moon. No one seems to notice the pattern. If anyone does notice, no one cares. Occasionally, someone you know sees Jesse when you and Jonathan are out in the park playing with balls. Jonathan always says that he's taking care of his sister's dog while she's away on business. His sister travels a lot, he explains. Oh, no, Stella doesn't mind, but she's always been a bit nervous around dogs. 
even though Jessie's such a good dog, so she stays home during the walks. Sometimes strangers come up shyly. What a beautiful dog, they say. What a big dog. What kind of dog is that? A husky wolfhound cross, Jonathan says airily. Most people accept this. Most people know as much about dogs as dogs know about the space shuttle. Some people know better, though. Some people look at you and frown a little and say, looks like a wolf to me. Is she part wolf? Could be, Jonathan always says with a shrug, his tone as breezy as ever. He spins a little story about how his sister adopted you from the pound because you were the runt of the litter. No one else wanted you. Now look at you. No one would ever take you for a runt now. The strangers smile and look encouraged and pat you on the head because they like stories about dogs being rescued from the pound. You sit down and stay during these conversations. You do whatever Jonathan says. You wag your tail and cock your head and act charming. You let people scratch you behind the ears. You're a good dog. The other dogs in the park who know more about their own species than most people do aren't fooled by any of this. You make them nervous and they tend to avoid you or to act supremely submissive if, avoid if avoidance isn't possible. They grovel on their bellies, on their backs. They crawl away backwards, whining. Jonathan loves this. Jonathan loves it when you're the alpha with the other dogs. Of course, he loves it that he's your alpha. Because that's another thing people don't understand about your condition. They think you're vicious, a ravening beast, a fanged monster from hell. In fact, you're no more bloodthirsty than any dog not trained to mayhem. You haven't been trained to mayhem. You've been trained to chase balls. You're a pack animal. It's animals, an animal who craves hierarchy. And you, Jesse, are a one-man dog. Your man's Jonathan. You adore him. You do anything for him. You would let strangers who would know a wolf from a wolfhound scratch you behind the ears. The only fight you and Jonathan have the first year in the States is about the collar. Jonathan insists that Jesse wear a collar. Otherwise, he says, I could be fined. There are policemen in the park. Jesse needs a collar and an ID tag and rabies shots. Jesse, you say on two feet, needs no such, needs no such thing. You, Stella, are bristling as you say this, even though you don't have fur at the moment. Jonathan, you tell him, ID tags are for dogs who wonder. Jesse will never leave your side unless you throw a ball for her. I'm not going to get rabies. All I eat is alpo, not dead raccoons. How am I going to get rabies? It's the law, he says gently. It's not worth the risk, Stella. And then he comes and rubs your head and shoulders that way, the way you've never been able to resist. Soon the two of you are in bed having a lovely sport fuck. Somehow by the end of the evening, Jonathan's won. Well, of course he has. He's the alpha. So the next time you're on four feet, Jonathan puts a strong chain choke collar and an ID tag around your neck, and you go to the vet and get your shots. You don't like the vet's office much because it smells of too much fear and pain. The people there pat you and give you milk bones, tell you how beautiful you are. The vet's hands are gentle and kind. The vet likes dogs. She also knows wolves from wolfhounds. She looks at you hard and then looks at Jonathan. A gray wolf, she asks. I don't know, says Jonathan. She could be a hybrid. She doesn't look like a hybrid to me. So Jonathan launches into his breezy story about how you were the runt of the litter at the pound. You wag your tail and lick the vet's hand and act utterly adoring. The vet's not having any of it. She strokes your head. Her hands are kind, but she smells disgusted. Mr. Argent, gray wolves are endangered. At least one of her parents was a dog, Jonathan says. He's starting to sweat. Now she doesn't, she doesn't look endangered, does she? There are laws about keeping exotics as pets, the vet says. She's still stroking your head. You're still wagging your tail. Now you start to whine because the vet smells angry and Jonathan smells afraid, especially endangered exotics. She's a dog, Jonathan says. If she's a dog, the vet says, may I ask why you haven't had her spayed? Jonathan sputters. Excuse me? You got her from the pound. Do you know how animals wind up at the pound, Mr. Argent? They land there because people breed them and then don't want to take care of all those puppies or kittens. They land there. We're here for a rabies shot, Jonathan says. Can we get a rabies shot, please? Mr. Argent, there are regulations about breeding endangered species. I understand that, Jonathan says. There are also regulations about rabies shots. If you don't give my dog her rabies shot, the vet shakes her head, but she gives you the rabies shot, and Jonathan gets you out of there fast. Bitch, he says on the way home. He's shaking. Animal rights fascist bitch. Who the hell does she think she is? She thinks she's a vet. She thinks she's somebody who's supposed to take care of animals. Can't say any of this because you're on four legs. 
lie in the back seat of the car on their special sheepskin cover Jonathan brought to protect the upholstery from your fur and whine. You're scared. You like the vet, afraid of what she might do. She doesn't understand your condition. How could she? The following week, after you're fully changed back, there's a knock at the door while Jonathan's at work. You put down your copy of L and pad barefooted across to the door. You open it to find a woman in uniform. A white truck with animal control written on it is parked in the driveway. Good morning, the officer says. We've received a report that there may be an exotic animal on this property. May I come in, please? Of course, you tell her. You let her in. You offer her coffee, which she doesn't want. You tell her that there aren't any exotic animals here. You invite her to look around and see for herself. Of course, there's no sign of a dog, but she's not satisfied. According to our records, Jonathan Argent of this address had a dog vaccinated last Saturday. We've been told that the dog looked very much like a wolf. Can you tell me where that dog is now? We don't have her anymore, you say. She got loose and jumped the fence on Monday. It's a shame. She was such a lovely animal. The animal control lady scowls. Did she have ID? Of course, you say. A collar with tags. If you find her, you'll call us, won't you? She's looking at you hard, as hard as the vet did. Of course. We recommend that you check the pound at least every few days, too. You might want to put up flyers, put an ad in the paper. Thank you, you tell her. We'll do that. She leaves. You go back to reading L, secure in the knowledge that your collar's tucked into your underwear drawer upstairs. Jesse will never show up at the pound. Jonathan's incensed when he hears about this. He reels off a string of curses about the vet. Do you think you could rip her throat out, he asks. No, you say, annoyed. I don't want to, Jonathan. I liked her. She's doing her job. Wolves don't just attack people. You know better than that. It wouldn't be smart, even if I wanted to. It would just mean people would have to track me down and kill me. Now look, relax. We'll go to a different vet next time, that's all. We'll do better than that, Jonathan says. We'll move. So you move to the next county over, to a larger house with a larger yard. There's even some wild land nearby, forest and meadows. That's where you and Jonathan go for walks now. When it's time for your rabies shot the following year, you go to a male vet, an older man who's been recommended by some friends of friends of Jonathan's, people who do a lot of hunting. This vet raises his eyebrows when he sees you. She's quite large, he says pleasantly. Fish and wildlife might be interested in such a large dog. Her size will add another, oh, hundred dollars to the bill, Johnny. I see. Jonathan's voice is icy. You growl and the vet laughs. Loyal, isn't she? You planning to breed her, of course? Of course, Jonathan snaps. Lucrative business, that. Her pups will pay for her rabies shot, believe me. Do you have a sire lined up? Not yet. Jonathan sounds like he's strangling. The vet strokes your shoulders. You don't like his hands. You don't like the way he touches you. You growl again and again. The vet laughs. Well, give me a call when she goes into heat. I know some people who might be interested. Slimy bastard, Jonathan says when you're back home again. You didn't like him, Jesse, did you? I'm sorry. You lick his hand. The important thing is that you have your rabies shot. The license is up to date. This vet won't be reporting you to animal control. You're legal. You're a good dog. You're a good wife, too. As Stella, you cook for Jonathan, clean for him, shop. You practice your English while devouring Cosmopolitan and Martha Stewart Living in addition to L. You can't work or go to school because the week of the full moon will keep getting in the way. You keep yourself busy. You learn to drive and you learn to entertain. You learn to shave your legs and pluck your eyebrows, to mask your natural odor with harsh chemicals, to walk in high heels. You learn the artful use of cosmetics and clothing so that you be even more beautiful than you are unnatural. You're stunning. Everyone says so. Tall and slim with long silver hair and pale piercing blue eyes. Your skin smooth. Your complexion flawless. Your muscles lean and taut. You're a good cook. A great fuck. Perfect trophy wife. But of course, during that first year, while Jonathan's 36 going on 37, you're only 21 going on 28. You can keep the accelerated aging from showing. You eat right, get plenty of exercise, become even more skillful with the cosmetics. You and Jonathan are blissfully happy. His colleagues, the old fogies in the anthropology department, are jealous. They stare at you when they think no one's looking. They'd all love to fuck you. Jonathan gloats after every party. After every party, he does just that. Most of Jonathan's colleagues are men. Most of their wives don't like you. Although a few make resolute efforts to be friendly, to ask you to lunch. 21 going on 28. You wonder if they somehow sense that you aren't one of them. 
There's another side to you, one with four feet. Later you realize that even if they knew about Jesse, they couldn't hate and fear you any more than they already do. They fear you because you're young, because you're beautiful and speak English with an exotic accent, because their husbands can't stop staring at you. They know their husbands want to fuck you. The wives may not be young and beautiful anymore, but they're no fools. They lost the luxury of innocence when they lost their smooth skin and flawless complexions. The only person who asks you to lunch and seems to mean it is Diane Harvey. She's 45, with thin gray hair and a wide face that's always smiling. She runs her own computer repair business, and she doesn't hate you. This may be related to the fact that her husband, Glenn, never stares at you, never gets too close to you during conversation. He seems to have no desire to fuck you at all. He looks at Diane the way all the other men look at you, as if she's the most desirable creature on earth, as if just being in the same room with her renders him scarcely able to breathe. He adores his wife, even though they've been married for 15 years, even though he's five years younger than she is and handsome enough to seduce a younger, more beautiful woman. Jonathan says that Glenn must stay with Diane for her salary, which is considerably more than his. You think Jonathan's wrong. You think Glenn stays with Diane for herself. Over lunch, as you gnaw an under overcooked steak in a bland fern bar, all glass and wood, Diane asks you kindly when you last saw your family, if you're homesick, whether you and Jonathan have any plans to visit Europe again soon. These questions bring a lump to your throat, because Diane's the only one who's ever asked them. You don't, in fact, miss your family. The parents who taught you to hunt, who taught you the dangers of continuing the line, the siblings with whom you tussled and fought over scraps of meat, because you transferred all your loyalty to Jonathan. But two is an awfully small pack. You're starting to wish Jonathan hadn't had that operation. You're starting to wish you could continue the line, even though you know it would be a foolish thing to do. You wonder if that's why your parents made it, even though they knew the dangers. I miss the smells back home, you tell Diane. Immediately, immediately you blush because it seems like a strange thing to say. You desperately want this kind woman to like you. As much as you love Jonathan, you yearn for someone else to talk to. But Diane doesn't think it's strange. Yes, she says, nodding. Tells you how homesick she still gets for her grandmother's kitchen, which had a signature smell for each season. Basil and tomatoes in the summer, apples in the fall, nutmeg and cinnamon in winter, thyme and lavender in the spring. She tells you that she's growing thyme and lavender in her own garden. She tells you about her tomatoes. She asks if you garden. You say no. In truth, you're not a big fan of vegetables, although you enjoy the smell of flowers because you enjoy the smell of almost anything. Even on two legs, you have a far better sense of smell than most people do. You live in a world rich with aroma. Even the scents most people consider noxious are interesting to you. As you sit in the sterile fern bar, which smells only of burnt meat and rancid grease and the harsh chemicals the people around you have put on their skin and hair, you realize that you really do miss the smells of home, for even the gardens smell older and wilder than the woods and meadows here. You tell Diane shyly that you'd like to learn to garden. Could she teach you? So she does. One Saturday afternoon, much to John's bemusement, Diane comes over with topsoil and trowels and flower seeds. The two of you measure out a plot in the backyard, plant and water and get dirt under your nails, and it's quite wonderful, really, about the best fun you've had on two legs, aside from sport fucks with Jonathan. Over dinner after Diane's left, you try to tell Jonathan how much fun it was. He doesn't seem particularly interested. He's glad you had a good time, but really, he doesn't want to hear about seeds. He wants to go up upstairs and have sex. So you do. Afterwards, you go through all of your old issues of Martha Stewart living, looking for gardening tips. You're ecstatic. You have a hobby now, something you can talk to other wives about. Surely some of them garden. Maybe now they won't hate you. So at the next party, you chatter brightly about gardening, but somehow all the wives are still across the room, huddled around a table, occasionally glaring in your direction. Well, the men cluster around you, their eyes bright, nodding eagerly at your description of weeds and aphids. You know, something's wrong here. Men don't like gardening, do they? Jonathan certainly doesn't. Finally, one of the wives, a tall blonde with a tennis tan and good bones, stalks over and pulls her husband away by the sleeve. Time to go home now, she tells him, and curls her lip at you. You know that look. You know how you know a snarl when you see it, even if the wife's too civilized to produce an actual growl. You asked Diane about this the following week while you were in her garden, admiring her tomato plants. Why do they hate me? You ask Diane. Oh, Stella, she says, you really don't know, do you? 
You shake your head and she goes on. They hate you because you're young and beautiful, even though that's not your fault. The ones who have to work hate you because you don't. The ones who don't have to work, whose husbands support them, hate you because they're afraid their husbands will leave them for younger, more beautiful women. Do you understand? You don't, not really, even though you're now 28 going on 35. Their husbands can't leave them for me, you tell Diane. I'm married to Jonathan. I don't want any of their husbands. Even as you say it, you know that's not the point. A few weeks later, you learn that the tall blonde's husband has indeed left her for an aerobics instructor, 20 years his junior. He showed me a picture, Jonathan says. She's a big hair bimbo. She's not half as beautiful as you are. What does that have to do with it, you ask him. You're angry and you aren't sure why. You probably know the blonde and it's not as if she's been nice to you. His poor wife. It was a terrible thing for him to do. Of course it was, Jonathan says soothingly. Would you leave me if I wasn't beautiful anymore, you ask him. Nonsense, Stella. You'll always be beautiful. That's when Jonathan's going on 38 and you're going on 35. The following year, the balance begins to shift. He's going on 39, you're going on 42. You take exquisite care of yourself. Really, you're as beautiful as ever. There are a few wrinkles now. It takes hours of crunches to keep your stomach as flat as it used to be. Doing crunches, weeding in the garden, you have plenty of time to think. In a year or two at the most, you'll be old enough to be Jonathan's mother. You're starting to think he might not like that. You've already gotten wind of catty faculty wife gossip about how quickly you're showing your age. The faculty wives see every wrinkle, even, though artfully, even through artfully applied cosmetics. During that 35 to 42 year, Diane and her husband move away. So now you have no one with whom to discuss your wrinkles or the catty faculty wives. You don't want to talk to Jonathan about any of it. He still tells you how beautiful you are. You still have satisfying sport fucks. You don't want to give him any ideas about declining desirability. You do a lot of gardening that year. Flowers, especially roses and herbs and some tomatoes in honor of Diane because Jonathan likes them. Your best times are the two foot times in the garden and the four foot times in the forest. You think it's no coincidence that both of these involve digging around in the dirt. You write long letters to Diane on email or sometimes when you're saying something you don't want Jonathan to find on the computer on old fashioned paper. Diane doesn't have much time to write back, does send the occasional email note, the even rarer postcard. You read a lot too, everything you can find, newspapers and novels and political analysis, literary criticism, true crime, ethnographic studies. You startle some of Jonathan's colleagues by casually dropping odd bits of information about their field, some other fields about fields they never heard of, forensic geography, agric agricultural ethics, post-structuralist mining. You think it's no coincidence that the obscure disciplines you're most interested in involve digging around in the dirt. Some of Jonathan's colleagues begin to comment not only on your beauty, but on your intelligence. Some of them back away a little bit. Some of the wives, although not many, become a little friendlier, start going out to lunch again. They're not with anyone you like as much as Diane. The following year, the trouble starts. Jonathan's going on 40. You're going on 49. You both work out a lot. You both eat right. Jonathan's hardly wrinkled at all yet, and your wrinkles are getting harder to hide. Your stomach refuses to stay completely flat no matter how many crunches you do. You've developed the merest hint of cottage cheese thighs. You forgo your old look, that slinky skin tight look, for long flowing skirts and dresses, accented with plenty of silver. You're going for exotic, elegant. You're getting there just fine. Heads still turn to follow you in the supermarket. But, but the sport fucks are less frequent. You don't know how much of this is normal aging and how much is lack of interest in Jonathan's part. He doesn't seem quite as enthusiastic as he once did. He no longer brings you herbal tea and hot water bottles during your transitions. The walks in the woods are a little shorter than they used to be. The ball throwing sessions in the meadows more perfunctory. And then one of your new friends over lunch asks you tactfully if anything's wrong. If you're ill because, well, you don't quite look yourself. Even as you assure her that you're fine, you know she means that you look a lot older than you did last year. <clears throat> At home, you try to discuss this with Jonathan. You knew it would be a problem eventually, you tell him. I'm afraid that other people are going to notice. If someone's going to figure it out. Stella, sweetheart, no one's going to figure it out. He's annoyed, impatient. Even if they think you're aging unusually quickly, they won't, they won't make the leap to Jesse. It's not in their worldview. 
wouldn't occur to them, even if you were aging 100 years for every one of theirs. They just think you had some unfortunate metabolic condition, that's all. Which, in a manner of speaking, you do. You wince. It's been five weeks since the last sport fuck. Does it bother you that I look older? You ask Jonathan. Of course not, Stella. Since he rolls his eyes when he says this, you're not reassured. You can tell from his voice that he doesn't want to be having this conversation. He wants to be somewhere else, maybe watching TV. You recognize that tone. You've heard Jonathan's colleagues use it on their own wives, usually while staring at you. You get through the year. You increase your workout schedule, mind cosmos for bedroom tricks to pique John's flagging interest. Consider and reject liposuction for your thighs. You wish you could have a facelift, but the recovery period's a bit too long. Not sure how it would work with your transitions. You read and read and read. You command an increasingly subtle grasp of the implications of the interconnections between different areas of knowledge. Ecotourism, third world famine relief, art history, automobile design. Your lunchtime conversations become richer. Your friendships with the faculty wives more genuine. You know that your growing wisdom is the benefit of aging. The compensation for your wrinkles and for your fading, although fading slowly as yet, beauty. You also know that Jonathan didn't marry you for wisdom. And now it's the following year. The year you're old enough to be Jonathan's mother. Although an unwed teenage one, you're going on 56 while he's going on 41. Your silver hair is losing its luster, becoming nearly gray. Sport fox coincide more or less with major national holidays. Your thighs begin to jiggle when you walk. She'd go ahead and have the liposuction, but Jonathan doesn't seem to notice anything but the outrageous cost of the procedure. You redecorate the house. You take up painting with enough success to sell some pieces to a local gallery. You start writing a book about gardening as a cure for ecotourism and agricultural abuses, and you negotiate a contract with a prestigious university press. Jonathan doesn't pay much attention to any of this. You're starting to think that Jonathan would only pay attention to a full-fledged Lon Chaney imitation, complete with bloody fangs. But if that was ever in your nature, it certainly isn't now. Jonathan and Martha Stewart have civilized you. On four legs, you're still magnificent, eliciting exclamations of wonder from other pet owners when you meet them in the woods. But Jonathan hardly ever plays ball in the meadow with you anymore. Sometimes he doesn't even take you to the forest. He walks, once measured in hours and miles, not clocking at minutes in suburban blocks. Sometimes Jonathan doesn't even walk you. Sometimes he just shoes you out into the backyard to do your business. He never cleans up after you either. You have to do that yourself, scooping old poop after you've returned to two legs. A few times you yell at Jonathan about this. He just walks away, even more annoyed than usual. You know you have to do something to remind him that he loves you, or loved you once. You know you have to do something to reinsert yourself into his field of vision. But you can't imagine what. You've already tried everything you can think of. There are nights when you cry yourself to sleep. Once Jonathan would have held you. Now he rolls over, turning his back to you, scoots to the farthest edge of the mattress. During that terrible time, the two of you go to a faculty party. There's a new professor there, a female professor. First one, <clears throat> the anthropology department has hired in 10 years. She's in her 20s, with long black hair and perfect skin. The men cluster around her the way they used to cluster around you. Jonathan's one of them. Standing with the other wives, pretending to talk about new films, you watch Jonathan's face. He's rapt, attentive, totally focused on the lovely young woman who's talking about her research into ritual scarification in New Guinea. You see Jonathan's eyes stray surreptitiously, and he thinks no one will notice, to her breasts, her thighs, her ass. You know Jonathan wants to fuck her. You know it's not her fault, any more than it was ever yours. She can't help being young and pretty. You hate her anyway. Over the next few days, you discover that what you hate most, hate even more than Jonathan wanting to fuck this young woman, is what your hate is doing to you, to your dreams, to your insides. The hate's your problem, you know. It's not Jonathan's fault, more than his lust for the young professor is hers. You can't seem to get rid of it. You can sense it making your wrinkles deeper, shriveling you as if you're a piece of newspaper thrown into a fire. You write Diane a long, anguished letter about as much of this as you can safely tell her. Of course, since she hasn't been around for a few years, she doesn't know how much older you look. So you simply said that you think Jonathan's fallen out of love with you since you're over 40 now. You write the letter on paper and send it through the mail. Diane writes back, not a postcard this time. 
She sends five single-spaced pages. She says that Jonathan's probably going through a midlife crisis. She agrees that his treatment of you is, in her words, barbaric. Stella, you're a beautiful, brilliant, accomplished woman. I've never known anyone who's grown so much in such interesting ways in such a short time. If Jonathan doesn't appreciate that, then he's an ass. It is time to ask yourself if you'd be happier elsewhere. I hate to recommend divorce. I also hate to see you suffering so much. The problem, of course, is economic. Can you support yourself if you leave? Is Jonathan likely to be reliable with alimony? At least, small comfort, I know. There are no children who need to be considered in all this. I'm assuming that you've You've always tried you that you've already tried couples therapy. If you haven't, you should. This letter plunges you into despair. No, Jonathan isn't likely to be reliable with alimony. Jonathan isn't likely to agree to couples therapy either. Some of your lunchtime friends have gone that route. The only way they ever get their husbands into the therapist's office was by threatening divorce on the spot. If you tried this, it would be a hollow threat. Unfortunate metabolic condition won't allow you to hold any kind of normal job, and your writing and painting income won't support you, and Jonathan knows all that as well as you do, and your continued safety is in his hands. If he exposed you, you shudder. In the old countries, the stories ran through peasants with torches. Here, you know, laboratories and scalpels would be more likely. Neither option is attractive. You go to the art museum because the bright, high, echoing rooms have always made it easier for you to think. You wander among abstract sculpture and impressionist paintings, among still lifes and landscapes, among portraits. One of the portraits is of an old woman. She has white hair and many wrinkles. Her shoulders stoop as she pours a cup of tea. The flowers on the china are the same pale luminous blue as her eyes, which are, you realize, the same blue as your own. The painting takes your breath away. This old woman is beautiful. You know, the painter, a 19th century English duke, thought so too. You know, Jonathan wouldn't. You decide once again to try to talk to Jonathan, make him his favorite meal, serve him his favorite wine, wear your most becoming outfit, gray silk with heavy silver jewelry. Your silver hair and blue eyes gleam in the candlelight, and the candlelight, you know, hides your wrinkles. This kind of production, at least Jonathan still notices. When he comes into the dining room for dining, for dinner, he looks at you and raises his eyebrows. What's the occasion? The occasion is that I'm worried, you tell him. You tell him how much it hurts you when he turns away from your tears. You tell him how much he misses sport fox. You tell him that since you clean up his messes more than three weeks out of every month, he can damn well clean up yours when you're on four legs. And you tell him that if he doesn't love you anymore, doesn't want you anymore, you'll leave. You go back home to the village on the edge of the forest near an alp and try to make a life for yourself. Oh, Stella, he says, of course I still love you. You can't tell if he sounds impatient or contrite. It terrifies you that we might not know the difference. How could you even think of leaving me after everything I've given you, everything I've done for you? That's been changing, you tell him, your throat raw. The changes are the problem, Jonathan. I can't believe you try to hurt me like this. I can't believe... Jonathan, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm reacting to the fact that you're hurting me. You're going to stop hurting me or not? He glares at you, pouting, and it strikes you that after all, he's very young much younger than you are. Do you have any idea how ungrateful you're being? Not many men would put up the, with a woman like you. Jonathan, I mean, do you have any idea how hard it's been for me? All the secrecy, all the lying, having to walk the damn dog. You used to enjoy walking the damn dog. You struggled to control your breathing, struggled not to cry. All right, look, you've made yourself clear. I'll leave. I'll go home. You'll do no such thing. You close your eyes. And what do you want me to do? Stay here knowing you hate me? I don't hate you. You hate me. If you didn't hate me, you wouldn't be threatening to leave. He gets up and throws his napkin down on the table. It lands in the gravy boat. Before leaving the room, he turns and says, I'm sleeping in the guest room tonight. Fine, you tell him dully. He leaves and you discover that you're trembling, shaking the way a terrier would or a poodle, not a wolf. Well, he's made himself very plain. You get up, clear away the uneaten dinner you spent all afternoon cooking, go upstairs to your bedroom. Yours now, not Jonathan's anymore. You change into jeans and a sweatshirt. You think about taking a hot bath because all your bones ache. If you allow yourself to relax into warm water, you'll fall apart. You dissolve into tears and there are things you have to do. Your bones aren't aching just because your marriage has ended. 
They're aching because the transition is coming up. You need to make plans before it starts. So you go into your study, turn on the computer, call up an internet travel agency. You book a flight back home for 10 days from today. You'll definitely be back on two feet again. You charge the ticket to your credit card. The bill will arrive in another month. By then you'll be long gone. Let Jonathan pay it. Money. You have to think about how you'll make money. How much money you'll take with you. You can't think about it now. Booking the flight will hit you like a blow. Tomorrow, when Jonathan's at work, you'll call Diane and ask her advice on all this. You tell her you're going home. She'll probably ask you to come stay with her, but you can't because of the transitions. Diane, of all the people you know, might understand. You can't imagine summing up the energy to explain. It takes all the energy you have to get yourself out of the study, back into your bedroom. You cry yourself to sleep. This time, Jonathan's not even across the mattress from you. You find yourself wondering if you, if you should have handled the dinner conversation differently. You should, if you should have kept yourself from yelling at him about the turds in the yard. If you should have tried to seduce him first. If the ifs could go on forever. You know that. You think about going home. You wonder if you'll still know anyone there. You realize how much you'll miss your garden and you start crying again. Tomorrow, first thing, you call Diane. When tomorrow comes, you can barely get out of bed. The transition has arrived early, and it's a horrible one, the worst ever. You're in so much pain you can hardly move. You're in so much pain that you moan aloud, but if Jonathan hears, he doesn't come in. During the brief pain-free intervals when you could think lucidly, you're grateful that you booked your flight as soon as you did. And then you realize that the bedroom door is closed and that Jessie won't be able to open it herself. You need to get out of bed. You need to open the door. You can't. The transition is too far advanced. It's never been this fast. It must be why it hurts so much. But the pain, paradoxically, it makes the transition seem longer than a normal one, rather than shorter. You moan and whimper, lose all track of time, finally howl, and blessedly the transition's over. You're on four feet. You can get out of bed now, and you do, but you can't leave the room. You howl, but if Jonathan's here, if he hears you, he doesn't come. There's no food in the room. Left the master bathroom toilet seat up by chance, so there's water full of interesting smells. That's good. And there's shoes to chew on. They offer neither nourishment nor any real comfort. You're hungry. You're lonely. You're afraid. You can smell Jonathan in the room, in the shoes, in the sheets, in the clothing, in the closet. But Jonathan himself won't come, no matter how much you howl. And then, finally, the door opens. It's Jonathan. Jesse, he says. Poor Jesse, you must be so hungry. I'm sorry. He's carrying your leash. He takes your collar out of your underwear drawer and puts it on you and attaches the leash. You think you're going for a walk now. You're ecstatic. Jonathan's going to walk you again. Jonathan still loves you. Let's go outside, Jesse he says, and you dutifully trot down the stairs to the front door. But instead he says, Jesse, this way. Come on, girl. Leads you on your leash to the family room at the back of the house, to sliding glass doors that open onto the backyard. You're confused, but you do what Jonathan says. You're desperate to please him. Even if he's no longer quite Stella's husband, he's still Jesse's alpha. He leads you into the backyard. There's a metal pole in the middle of the backyard. That didn't used to be there. Your canine mind wonders if it's a new toy. You trot up and sniff it, cautiously. As you do, Jonathan clips one end of your leash under a rig at the top of the pole. You yip in alarm. You can't move far. It's not that long a leash. You strain against the pole. The leash, the collar, none of them give. The harder you pull, the harder the choke collar make it for you, makes it for you to breathe. Jonathan's still next to you, stroking you, calm, reassuring. It's okay, Jess. I'll bring you food and water, all right? You'll be fine out here. Just for tonight. Tomorrow we'll go for a nice long walk, I promise. The ears perk up at walk, but you still whimper. Jonathan brings you food and water bowls outside and puts them within reach. You're so glad to have the food that you can't think about being lonely or afraid. You gobble your alpo, and Jonathan strokes your fur, tells you what a good dog you are, what a beautiful dog. You think maybe everything's going to be all right, because he hasn't stroked you this much in months, hasn't spent so much time talking to you, admiring you. Then he goes inside again. You strain towards the house as much as the choke collar will let you. You catch occasional glimpses of Jonathan, who seems to be cleaning. Here he is dusting the picture frames. Here he is running the vacuum cleaner. Now he's cooking. Beef stroganoff. You can smell it. 
Now he's lighting candles in the dining room. You start to whimper. You whimper even more loudly when a car pulls into the driveway on the other side of the house. You stop when you hear a female voice because you want to hear what it says. So terrible that your wife left you. You must be devastated. Yes, I am. I'm sure she's back in Europe now with her family. Here, let me show you the house. When he shows her the family room, you see her in her 20s with long black hair and perfect skin. See how Jonathan looks at her and you start to howl in earnest. Jesus, Jonathan's guest says, peering over at you through the dusk. What the hell is that? A wolf? My sister's dog, Jonathan says. Husky wolfhound mix. I'm taking care of her while my sister's away on business. She can't hurt you. Don't be afraid. He touches the woman's shoulder to silence her fear. She turns towards him and they walk into the dining room. And then after a while, the bedroom light flicks on. You hear laughter and other noises and you start to howl again. You howl all night. Jonathan doesn't come outside. Neighbors yell at Jonathan a few times. Shut that dog up, goddammit. Jonathan still never comes outside again. You're going to die here, tethered to the stake. But you don't. Towards dawn, you finally stop howling. You curl up and sleep, exhausted. You wake up, the sun's higher, and Jonathan's coming through the open glass doors. He's carrying another dish of Alpo. He smells of soap and shampoo. He can't smell the woman on him. You growl anyway because you're hurt and confused. Jesse, he says. Jesse, it's all right. Poor, beautiful Jesse. I've been mean to you, haven't I? I'm so sorry. He does sound sorry, truly sorry. You eat the alpo and he strokes you the same way he did last night and he unsnaps your leash from the pole and says, okay, Jess, through the gate into the driveway, okay? We're going for a ride. You don't want to go for a ride. You want to go for a walk. Jonathan promised you a walk. You growl, Jesse, into the car now. We're going to another meadow, Jess. It's farther away than our old one, but someone told me he saw rabbits there. He said it's really big. You'd like to explore a new place, wouldn't you? You don't want to go to a new meadow. You want to go to the old meadow, the one where you know the smell of every tree and rock. You growl again. Jesse, you're being a very bad dog. Now get in the car. Don't make me call animal control. You whine. You're scared of animal control. People who wanted to take you away so long ago when you lived in that other county. You know that animal control kills a lot of animals in that county and in this one. If you die as a wolf, you'll stay a wolf. They'd never know about Stella. As Jesse, you'd have no way to protect yourself except your teeth, and that would only get you killed faster. So you get into the car, although you're trembling. In the car, Jonathan seems more cheerful. Good Jesse. Good girl. We'll go to the new meadow and chase balls now, okay? It's a big meadow. You'll be able to run a long way. He tosses a new tennis ball into the back seat. You chew on it happily. The car drives along, traffic whizzing past. When you lift your head from chewing on the ball, you can see trees. So you put your head back down, satisfied, and resume chewing. And the car stops. Jonathan opens the door for you, and you hop out, holding your ball in your mouth. This isn't a meadow. You're in the parking lot of a low concrete building that reeks of excrement and disinfectant and fear. Fear. From the building you hear barking and howling, screams of misery. In the parking lot are parked two white animal control trucks. You panic. You drop your tennis ball and try to run, but Jonathan has the leash and he starts dragging you inside the building. You can't breathe because of the choke collar. You cough, gasping, trying to howl. Don't fight, Jesse. Don't fight me. Everything's all right. Everything's not all right. You can smell Jonathan's desperation. You can taste your own. And you should be stronger than he is, but you can't breathe. And he's saying, Jesse, don't bite me. It'd be worse if you bite me, Jesse. The screams of horror still swirl from the building, and you're at the door now. Someone's opening the door for Jonathan. Someone says, let me help you with that dog. You're scrabbling on the concrete, trying to dig your claws into the sidewalk just outside the door, but there's no purchase. They've dragged you inside, onto the linoleum. And everywhere are the smells and sounds of terror. Above your own whimpering, you hear Jonathan saying, she jumped the fence and threatened my girlfriend. Then she tried to bite me, so I have no choice. Such a shame. She's always been such a good dog. But in good conscience, I can't. You start to howl because he's lying. Lying. You never did any of that. Now you're surrounded by people, a man and two women, all wearing colorful cotton smocks that smell of a faintly of dog shit and cat pee. They're putting a muzzle on you. Even though you can hardly think through your fear and your pain, 
as Jonathan's walked back out the door, gotten into the car and driven away. Jonathan's left you here. Even with all of that, you know you don't care. You don't dare bite or snap. You know your only hope is being a good dog and acting as submissive as possible. So you whimper, crawl along on your stomach, try to roll over on your back to show your belly, but you can't because of the leash. Hey, one of the women says. The man's left. She bends down to stroke you. Oh, God, she's so scared. Look at her. Poor thing, the other woman says. She's beautiful. I know. Looks like a wolf mix. I know. First woman sighs and scratches your ears, and you whimper and wag your tail and try to lick her hand through the muzzle. Take me home, you tell her if you could talk. Take me home with you. You'll be my alpha, and I'll love you forever. I'm a good dog. The woman who's scratching you says wistfully, We could adopt her out in a minute, I bet. Not with that history. Not if she's a biter. Not even if we had room. You know that. I know. The voice is very quiet. Wish I could take her myself, though. Take home a biter. Lily, you have kids. Lily sighs. Yeah, I know. Makes me sick, that's all. You don't need to tell me that. Come on, let's get this over with. Did Mark go get, go get the room ready? Yeah. Okay, what did the owner say her name was? Stella. Okay, here, give me the leash, Stella. Come. Come on, Stella. The voice is sad, gentle, loving. You want to follow it, but you fight every step anyway until Lily and her friend have to drag you past the cages of other dogs who start barking and howling again, whose cries of pure terror, pure loss. You can hear cats grieving somewhere else in the building. You can smell the room at the end of the hall, the room to which you're getting inexorably closer. You smell the man named Mark behind the door. You smell medicine. You smell the fear of the animals who've been taken to that room before you. The overpowering everything else is the worst smell. The smell that makes you bare your teeth in the muzzle, pull against the choke collar and scrabble again, helplessly, for a purchase you can't get on the concrete floor. The pervasive metallic stench of death.